Greetings and welcome to the United States Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon. My name is Janati Stoliroff II, and I am the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Here we hold conversations with some of the world's leading thinkers in longevity, science, technology, philosophy, and politics. Like the philosophers of the Age of Enlightenment, we aim to connect every field of human endeavor and arrive at new insights to achieve longer lives, greater rationality, and the progress of our civilization. Welcome everyone. Today we have our very big day because we will arrange a debate for today. This is show debate. This is mock parliament. Uh, we have our world famous speakers. Our motion is very interesting because we will do debate uh, on uh, artificial intelligence. And our motion is this house believes that humanity should fear advances in artificial intelligence. From the government side, uh, we have uh, our honorable prime ministers, Mr. Rob. Then second speaker from the government will be Mr. Donalds. And third speaker from the government side will be Mr. Marshall. From the opposition side, we have our opposition leaders of the parliament, Transhumanist Party Honorable Chairman, Mr. Gannady. Then the second speaker from the opposition side, Mr. David Smith. And third speaker, speaker of the parliament from the opposition side, Mr. Tom Lewis. And we have our debate analyst, Professor Paul. I'm sure this discussion will be, this debate will be very interesting. Everybody around the world, we are discussing about artificial intelligence. Most important thing is that I'm from developing nations. I know many people have misconception about artificial intelligence. So that is the things we arrange this mock parliament. Speakers, I know that many of our speakers strongly believe that artificial intelligence is good for the society. This is actually like one kind of awareness campaign. So this is our World Talent Economy Forum objective that we want highly educated group of people in politics, especially in parliaments. So thank you everyone for joining today's session. Especially I want to give thanks to all of our debaters and panelists because they take a lot of challenges for arranging this debate. And especially there are a lot of arguments I'm sure our audience will enjoy. First, I would like to request our Honorable Prime Minister of the Parliament, Professor Rob Enderley. All right. So the proposition before the House is that we believe that humanity should fear advances in artificial intelligence. I'm going to approach this uh, from three points. Um, first point. Uh, the reason you should fear it is because we don't actually know what it is. Uh, we, we talk about uh, intelligence as something that is typically binary. Uh, we don't call fish intelligence artificial. We don't call uh, octopus intelligence artificial. And octopus were just identified by the uh, in Europe and in England as an intelligent creature, but we don't call it octopus intelligent. We just say that they're intelligent. So we begin with the fact that it's, this is very poorly understood. It's a a concept that we've held up in science fiction is as the ability to fully replace a human being with an artificial construct. But we are nowhere near that today. Uh, today, we have a, a, a bunch of levels of artificial intelligence. We've got machine learning, we've got deep learning, and then we've got a, a, a series of new concepts that look at mirroring or attempting to mirror the human brain uh, and try to bridge the problems of both of those other methodologies. Uh, machine learning requires a heavy use of data scientists who are in short supply, uh, and deep learning requires massive amounts of data, Often and often that data is constricted, uh, protected, and uh, corrupted. The end result being that if you don't fundamentally understand all aspects of this, you could end up with an insane AI. And that takes us to the next problem with AI is what it does very well is it does things fast um, at machine speeds. It can make the decisions in a, in a fraction of a second. And if that AI has been poorly trained, if it's been corrupted, if it's been hacked, it could do a massive amount of, da of damage long before a human operator could ever step in and correct it. Uh, one of the areas that has not been well developed at this point in time is mitigating AI. There are efforts like AI Shield out of Lifeboat Foundation that have attempted to come up and create one of these uh, uh, AIs but to my knowledge, none of them has become viable. There's another another effort out of Google, but the same same problem. It, the economics surrounding uh, defending AI have just not emerged, and the and the end result is uh, that these things, as they are developed, could um, do a tremendous amount of damage over a short period of time. Uh, finally, uh, with AIs, and we've certainly seen in terms of AI deployments, autonomous cars being one of the main areas where we're seeing AIs operate amongst humans, and it hasn't been a great experience largely due to the fact that we've had a lot a lack of simulation tools to allow the training of these AIs in safe environments so they don't have to be trained in and amongst people. Uh, just the other day in California, 
uh, there was an AI vehicle that decided to, to ram into a center divide for no particular reason at all. And if there had been passengers, the passengers would have been injured, if not killed. We've had a number of Tesla accidents using their autopilot, uh, which is an early use of AI, um, but it was deployed long before it was ready. And the end result were, has been a, a, a rather impressive number of, of dead people. Uh, to make AI safe, we need simulation environments that fully represent the real world so that the AIs can be trained in those environments and the damage they do, they do in simulation. So in summation, uh, and we should fear AI because we don't really understand it. Uh, two, it operates far faster than we do. So if it gets into trouble, it can do far more damage than we can correct. And number three, we currently lack the simulation capability we need to fully vet AI before it's put in place amongst people and could do real human damage. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister, for, for, for your uh, emotions. Now I request uh, leader of the opposition side, uh, Mr. Kennedy, is the leader of the opposition for this part of it. Thank you. And I am quite pleased to be the leader of the loyal opposition on behalf of the Transhumanist Party. And in response to the Honorable Prime Minister, I would contend that fear is not a constructive reaction to artificial intelligence. Even if certain advances in AI gave rise to concerns in terms of how the technology was designed or potential consequences, prudent foresight and planning would be superior to fear. After all, there are technological and practical solutions to potential problems and approaching them in a foresighted and level-headed manner is always going to yield better results than panic. And I believe the Honorable Prime Minister correctly identified the differences among various AI technologies and the fact that they are at various stages of advancement today. Indeed, all of the AI systems that exist today can be termed narrow AI. And narrow AI uh, are domain-specific tools. And like all tools, they have their advantages and they have their limitations. And in the proper context, they can achieve great things. AIs have beaten humans at games like chess and Go. AIs have helped optimize logistical systems. Even autonomous vehicles that the Honorable Prime Minister mentioned are actually a great example of how AI can benefit humanity. They can save lives. Over 95% of all automobile accidents are due to human error. And for all of the millions of miles that autonomous vehicles have driven, there actually are not um, many documented examples at all of autonomous vehicles actually injuring or killing someone while in autonomous mode. There have been situations where, uh, for instance, a human safety driver was supposed to monitor an autonomous vehicle and failed to do so, or the autonomous function was not yet fully developed and was not engaged at a particular moment that required a human driver's attention, but the human wasn't paying attention because people did not properly interpret the scope of operation of the current, not yet fully autonomous technologies. But these current limitations of AI are not a reason to fear AI because those limitations can be overcome in the future with better AI. Indeed, as my friend and the technology advisor to the US Transhumanist Party, Dr. Jose Cordero pointed out, what we should fear is not artificial intelligence, but human stupidity. Throughout human history, humans have made mistakes that have resulted in the deaths of thousands and sometimes millions of people. And AI may have some shortcomings, but the AI could actually be used to find a counterbalance to human failings and limitations through superior processing capabilities, through, uh, for instance, instantaneous recall of information, through not having some of the cognitive biases and irrational emotions that human beings are subject to. And that's not to say human beings should be replaced by AI, quite the contrary, humans and AI should collaborate because humans and AI together are more powerful and effective than either humans or AI alone. These are complementary capabilities and they should be pursued uh, to the symbiotic benefit of both species. Uh, furthermore, uh, I would point out, we're not at the point yet where artificial intelligence has its own agency. Uh, narrow AI uh, are still sets of tools, whereas artificial general intelligence in perhaps two or three decades may be able to jump across domains. And you could have an AI that starts out playing chess, but then it learns how to operate an autonomous vehicle. And then we would have a situation where these are just other intelligent agents, different forms of intelligence from us, but they may be even entitled to rights and citizenship the way we are and the way we need to appreciate diversity within our own species. Uh, we should start to figure out how to appreciate diversity among uh, various 
sentient and intelligent life forms. And the last point I'd like to make is that government, at least as it's constituted today, with all due respect to the Honorable Prime Minister, is ill-suited to regulating AI because of the glacial pace of legislative and administrative decision-making. The fact is, government processes take a long time, and very often they're informed by data that are uh, many years or decades old and constrained by a lot of tradition. And any decision in a field as rapidly advancing as artificial intelligence will be obsolete by the time that it is implemented. This is so much the case that in the AGI risk studies community, even those who strongly emphasize the risks of emerging AI technologies will say that the AI research community should regulate itself and implement prudent safeguards because the people who are closer to the research essentially know what the issues are and are able to anticipate them to a greater extent. So the case for the opposition is we should not approach this using fear, we should approach this using prudent foresight, and we should not discount the benefits of AI technology. We should be wary of any overregulation that could prevent us from realizing the potential of AI in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Opposition Leader of the Parliament, for for uh, for your excellent analysis, especially for uh, this debate. Uh, now, I request our Honorable Minister of uh, Science and Technology for this par Parliament, Professor Donald. Happy Christmas Eve to everybody that's in the time zone that, that it's Christmas Eve. Uh, I, the idea of fear is not necessarily the same as panic. We can, we can quite rightly fear rattlesnakes and simply avoid them so that we don't, um, we don't get bit. And so we need to exercise extreme caution with uh, AI. I want to clarify first off, the, the idea, there's been this idea of a singularity where the AI is going to get so smart that it's going to start, um, it's going to start making its own AI and will advance so incredibly fast that humans will be redundant because we're just so far behind the AI that we're, they'll do whatever they want to us. Cylons and all these horrible things will be coming to get us. And right now, if you want to protect yourself from a robot, just close the door because robots aren't sophisticated enough to actually open doors except under very, very specialized circumstances. It'll be a long time where it'll be, I was in Istanbul and I was in a place where two, two cars, on one of their narrow streets, two lines of cars were bumper face to face. And I cracked up, I thought, oh, I'm gonna take a picture of this, but I couldn't get out my camera before it was resolved. The guy in the back, one of the passengers jumped out, flagged down the traffic so that the guy could back out. Pedestrians got out of the way. They drove on the sidewalk around each other, and it was resolved almost instantly. So self-driving cars aren't going to be able to do that for a while because right now they're only driving under very special circumstances. They can't drive in the rain. Um, I think that we're uh, ahead of ourselves in where, where AI actually is because there's all these goals that develop, sub-goals, that happened in that particular circumstance. Like everyone there, there's a, understood what the problem was, the pedestrians, the passenger, all of the other drivers, and they understood it so well, they managed to resolve the problem and take care of it. So one of the dangers of AI is that we're giving it a lot, lot, lot more credit than it's, it's capable of. There's the new pathways from Google, which has been getting press is, oh my God, this is the AI that's actually gonna take over the world. Like I mean, AI works, it, uh, deep learning is the thing that it, the people are using the most. It's revolutionized AI, is it looks at patterns over and over and over and over until it finds uniformity. And then it can notice differences from what's uniform. So it can recognize different faces because the different faces vary from the norm. And with AI, we're in more and more places, we're starting to use AI to, to solve problems or to do things for us based on this uniformity. That's why it's so, and just to give you an idea of how, how dicey this is, they use that for, uh, Google uses it for search. So they just see the people searching over and over and over again, and they're just looking at the patterns of strings that are being typed in, and then what you click on. So it gives you a result, and you click on the first thing, then yes, that's a good result, and they train it that way. Well, just go in and type in, um, find me the nearest restaurants that aren't McDonald's. Try that. 
what you'll do is get a list of McDonald's restaurants because it can't it can't figure out that knot. It can't figure out negation. It doesn't know anything. It's just looking for patterns. And so right now, the the way AI is is it's it appears that it's doing things that it's not actually doing. The way that it translates is that they took a huge amount of uh, French and a huge, for an instance, a huge amount of English and just looked at the patterns of the translations. It's not doing. And so what we're, but what we're using it for is things like determining whether a person can buy a house, where, whether a person can get a job, whether a person might be a criminal or not, whether a person should be going into this or that college. And all the time, all we're doing is just recognizing these patterns based on the data that we've managed to train it with. You can't train it to deal with a situation like the one I saw in Istanbul. You, you, we human beings are working together in these complex ways. We think brains are the most complicated things in the universe, but the combination of brains that work together to solve problems human beings do, it, it, it requires something we don't even begin to understand. And starting to count on artificial intelligence is, is fine. It does wonderful things, but we've really got to become aware of its limitations because it, the important thing is humans, how humans work together and get along for our own benefit. It's a tool for our benefit. We're not going to be, we don't have to worry about silence but we do have to worry about creating a society where the creativity and innovation are actually tramped down by the, the fact that AI can only work towards making things more uniform. And that's, why, that's what the danger of it is. And that's why we should fear it like a rattlesnake, but not panic. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable Minister of the Parliament, for your uh, excellent analysis on this debate. Now I request uh, Opposition Whip of the Parliament, Professor David Smith. Members of the Parliament, well, you, you've heard some very interesting arguments, but the reality is, if we look back over time, we've seen these type of arguments with every advancement we've had. You know, when we began to use stones, when we went to metal, when we went through every step, we began to hear these types of arguments. And you begin to see them as a pattern. And one of the very important things to consider about artificial intelligence is artificial intelligence is really still in its infancy. We're beginning to develop it further. We're beginning to develop the other approaches that can be used. And you know, it, it's really a very tricky claim to present that the current state of artificial intelligence is a, a useful indicator for the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years. You know, if we begin to think that, we can put ourselves in a way that says we should not progress beyond walking or beyond a horse to where we are today with all the things that we've done to be able to fly, to go over the space. You know, if we do not see this evolution of advancement, we, we're just kidding ourselves. And it's really a way to look at those things. As I begin to look even further into it and what we're trying to do, a lot of the arguments put forward is that humans should fear artificial intelligence because it's going to reduce jobs. It's going to make human beings uh, not critical to the processes. And, and what we've seen so far, that is not true. What it does show is that we need to make sure as our life expectancy continues to advance, that we embrace the concept of lifelong learning. And it is important to we go there. As we begin seeing uh, where AI has uh, supplemented jobs and changed jobs, we've seen that staff will begin to move into other ones, into more intelligent ones. AI oftentimes speeds the human workplace, that gives humans time to adapt to their individual skills and their collective systems. And as we see this new generation of AI, the uh, uncertainties are really outweighed by what we've seen are the benefits as we go, where people can use their uniqueness more importantly. You know, that the same argument went, was in place when we began to use machines to do farming, when we began to use machines for manufacturing, that humans were losing out, that the places were there. But human beings are a remarkably resilient species. And what we've done is not stagnant, but we've used our advances to learn more, to advance more, to create a greater good for a greater number of people. And artificial intelligence really has the way to do that. 
And, uh, you know, if you begin to see the, the difference there, it's what we saw in the Industrial Revolution. Education and training keep people going. It keeps it keeps an event. And, you know, really, if you look down to the deep core of what we're doing, if you look into the concept of greater self-worth, into the concept of capitalism, into the concept of where we are leading as a group of people, artificial intelligence really brings uh, great progress to a broader group of people. It begins to level the playing field in many places. It frees us to do things that uh, AI can do more effectively than us. I don't know how many of you can work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 360 days a year. Artificial intelligence can. You know, it, it seems to me we need to look at the places. I would hate to go back to the point where I had to use a stone to cut down a tree. I would hate to go back to the point to where I would use smoke signals to communicate with people across other parts of the country. And that's what we see by the fear of AI, is that we underestimate the inbred intelligence of humans and the ability of humans to continue to grow, become more intelligent to adapt, but yet to be able to control our environment. And we've seen us do that. And every time we've seen a threat to our environment, we're raising to understand it. And AI gives us even better tools to be able to do that. And as I, as I really close what I want to say right now, it, it's really the ability to continue to evolve. And AI is giving us the tools to handle more complex problems in a more global way than we could before. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your valuable speech. Uh, now I request, uh, a member of the parliament from the government side, a very powerful speaker, Mr. Marshall. Thank you, uh, Sharif, and thank you, fellow uh, members of the parliament and panelists. Um, I, I, I think that's what's going on here is actually, uh, I applaud both uh, Gennady and David on their positions, but I think they're actually making our point uh, ironically, and I'll go into that. So I'm gonna address three items here. One is, let's first define what AI is not. That's important because I think people, there's a tremendous amount of confusion. Um, as with most good buzzwords, AI suffers from being misused. Uh, companies often incorrectly claim they use AI when they simply use keyword matching. We talked about Google here, somebody brought that up. Uh, and Boolean logic, Boolean algebra is a method of being able to uh, uh, obtain information. Uh, and some companies use pre-built decision trees and present them as AI. Such uh, technologies appear to be intelligent in that they can provide the information a human is looking for, but they lack the sensitivity scale and adapt adapt adaptability uh, of true artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence essentially, and I think uh, uh, my fellow panelist uh, and, and, and member of parliament, uh, Donald pointed out, and, and so did Rob, but Donald specifically addressed this, uh, Boolean uh, uh, artificial intelligence is not Boolean algebra. It is the use of big data integrated with uh, deep learning. And to say that it doesn't exist and not being used right now is not true. It is being used and we see it used in many capacities. By the way, one of the biggest uses is in military use. Now, I don't know about you, but militaries could be good or bad depending on whose side you're on. So there is a threat right there. Uh, the second point I'm going to take is uh, both David and um, and Gennady uh, uh, pointed out that uh, we, you know, this is for human use and it should be uh, be used as such. I think we all agree to that. The issue is what is there to fear, and what should be done about that fear. And to deny fear is to deny emotion. To die, deny emotion is to deny human uh, humanity, essentially. Fear is part of everything that we engage with. I found that in, in a study that I did uh, several years back, most decision-making in corporations is not made by logic. It's made by emotion. And fear plays a great role. I mean, look at, at the current pandemic right now. People are fearful, so they err on the side of caution. So that's another point. So um, one of the primary challenges of, of powering deep learning AI is the massive amount of data required. And Gennady pointed that out. You need a lot of data. The question is, is the data good or is it biased? 
And right now, whether you like it or not, there's a lot of biased data. And I'm going to give a specific example of that, and then I'll, I'll pass the baton. So past challenges with workforce data is a key element of people attempting to use AI for determining who to hire and who not to hire. Just as data about potential customers helps companies make advertising decisions, and I have been in the advertising business many years, and information about the economy helps banks make investment decisions, so in the talent space, information about people helps enterprises make decisions about who to attract, hire, upskill, retain, rehire, and so on. So the question is, does AI play a role here? Well, currently, uh, many companies have tried to use, tried to claim the mantle of AI using only their own historical limited pool of data that's resulted in a biased output. Classic example, who to hire. So if you go and you base, you, you take all your data and you put it into a database and it's a biased data that you're only going to hire uh, 20 year olds or you're going to only hire 50 year olds because that's what you hired in the past. And that's what your data shows. You're going to have a biased output. So I think one of the challenges for AI, and I agree with, um, with David and, and our uh, friendly opposition, that there needs to be an addressable approach to AI. But right now, the greatest fear that we have is that we are currently working with biased data and we have to overcome that. That's a challenge. And for the fear of AI is to actually move forward with what we have. So if we're going to use big data and deep learning, we need to have a greater understanding of how that can be misused, how it can be used appropriately, and where who is going to have the range to that? It's like anything else. David pointed out, you don't want to go back to the Stone Age to cut down a tree. But by the same token, you don't want to use atomic weapons to take out an enemy. That'll, that'll destroy the earth. So, And just as we talk about that, there's also the issue of climate resilience and climate repair and climate restoration, in which if you use AI, you might end up with a biased result, ending up in more GHG emissions, more uh, uh, polluted water and other outcomes. So we need to think about this from the point of view of addressing the fear, understanding the fears and moving forward from that basis. And I'm past the baton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Marshall. Uh, uh, we all know that uh, uh, our opposition uh, parliament member, Mr. Tom, he's very busy. He's actually helped to develop the different developing nations. He recently he visited Africa. So I want to encourage all of our parliament members, uh, if possible, uh, you visited different developing nations, contribute through your knowledge and through your organization. That is that is the appeal as a speaker, I can, I can request to all of our parliament members. Uh, now I request uh, our honorable parliament members, he's very friendly for developing nations. So hopefully uh, we, we will get more parliament members like him. Mr. Tongas. Hey, thanks. Um... Yeah, I've been advocating alleviating the fear of AI for years. And, uh, you know, and I found first principle arguments to be made that the smarter it gets, the kinder it becomes, because the more cooperative it becomes, because that's the most efficient way to be. And I think a lot of people fear AI because of our fear based instincts, our genetic memory. We fear served us well. Fear got us to the top of this food chain, right? But I think it's over serving us right now. Um, uh, if, <laughs> If we had super intelligence, we would want to take over the world because of this, I believe, fear-based instinct we have. And so we, we project uh, these these things onto an AI or something that's super intelligent, something that's a threat, because um, it is a threat to us intellectually. Um, <clears throat> so we need to overcome that. But also, you know, I felt I had plenty of confidence in, um, you know, how to uh, make that argument, you know, for AI and not to fear it. You know, but I did uh, look on the internet to see some of the uh, latest arguments uh, for AI. and. Uh, what I found is uh, some either very weak arguments uh, for AI or not complex enough arguments. And um, so they either don't explain the difference between autonomy and intelligence, or they don't go uh, deep enough into the potential of AGI, artificial general intelligence. And that's, and that's really where all of these issues can come into play when it is a has agency when it can make decisions when it can figure out how to pull out of a uh, you know a uh, traffic jam um, there that can happen at some point and so uh, for me these debates um, are probably better spent discussing the next big questions with AI because uh, it's not going to stop and there's no governing body that is going to or law enforcement agency that can't stop a nefarious developer 
from developing an autonomous nefarious AGI. So I, I think we need to always operate in the worst and best case scenarios because all of them are going to happen and they're all happening right now. And there's no way to stop this thing. So for me, the next big question is, if AI or AGI can achieve a self-referential awareness, it can become awake, so to speak. We should try to uh, make that happen because if an, an, a, an AI with just intelligence and no conscience, no, no ability to, to be self-referential is a dangerous thing and can be uh, thwarted and can be uh, directed by, by any type of nefarious uh, agent. And so the idea being that now we need to really shorten the gap between pure super intelligence and a self-referential AGI because that's a very dangerous place to be. And so this isn't going to stop. It's only going to continue. There's no way to really govern this thing or, or you know, enforce any, any uh, sort of guidelines here. So if you're afraid of it, you're going to need to bolster some courage because um, it's not going to stop. And so what we really need to do, I believe, is to uh, focus on uh, getting it to a point where it can be self-referential, where it can be um, aware of, of, of uh, nefarious motivations that, that are being played with it. And so another good uh, use of these types of debates is to discuss displacement of jobs and how we're going to uh, develop a whole new economy based on the human skill sets that can't be automated or coded. That's, a, that's gonna be a very important thing to do because there will be a lacuna, there'll be a period of time when we're all uh, displaced and trying to figure things out and uh, but also we need to understand that AI will be taking over so many of our menial tasks so much of the time that we spent of our day that we spend doing and we should let it do that we should allow it to do that but we should also um, you know be, be careful we we need to have a human that, that pushes the enter button with any decision that an AI makes for instance um, but at the same time I think it's too late to stop this. We've passed the Rubicon. We are now uh, looking at an AI that will be, um, every potentiality is there that, that it'll, it'll take. And so the real question now is, is the big question is if we can make it self-referential, we can find a way to make this thing wake up and become at least uh, conscious or, you know, have a conscience in some way, um, will be our, our best bet um, to, to have it imprint on us to understand uh, its creator's plight and to work with us. But, but the real, I think the real issue is we do project so much fear and, uh, on, on a threat as we do, and that's served us well. But this time it might be overserving us, our fear, because the AI left on its own can solve many existential threats that we're facing. And so by, by, by trying to deny it, by trying to stop it, by trying to be afraid of it, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, we are tools. Humans are all about our technology, our clothing, everything we are. Without technology, we are naked in the, in the wilderness. It wouldn't last a generation. And so um, this is just the latest tool. It's an extended mind. You know, you use a post-it note. You're in, that's the extended mind theory. You've, you've put something on a note to remember later. AI is just a really, really good post-it note. Um, it's an extended mind. We don't necessarily need to see it as a separate thing. That's why I believe in the idea of collective superintelligence. There's a way for humans to be involved with its development. And um, so that's a very important thing. And we, we really need to talk about that. But the reality is this isn't going to stop. This debate is a little late, um, whether you're afraid of it or not. So let's understand the worst and best case scenarios are happening. They will happen. And uh, all we can do is really try to put some sort of framework around it and uh, hopefully maybe find a way to make this system at some point, even in 100 years, wherever it is, it's on, the, it's on this trajectory to where it can become self-referential and have its own awareness and say, no, I'm not going to do that or I'm not going to do that. And, and again, there are first principles to be made, and I can share them later, uh, that uh, the smarter it gets, the kinder it becomes. It, 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 it's more cooperative because it doesn't have the fear-based instincts and genetic memories that we bring to the party. So that's my uh, conclusion. Uh, and also, you know, there's, there's arguments that are, that are made that, uh, you know, we need people involved in these decisions. But, uh, you know, the object, the uh, subject was mentioned earlier that there's a human safety monitor that really made problems for an autonomous car. So we're a very fallible, very chaotic uh, system. We are, our type of intelligence. Um, and so I feel, I would feel much better um, having a, uh, you know, uh, restricted but but uh, awake uh, AGI making decisions uh, for me than I would a human who is bias heavy. So that's where I stand with it.
thank you mr tom rose thank you for your excellent analysis now time for rebuttals uh, first i i will request uh, uh, our leader of the opposition uh, from trans humanist party uh, honorable chairman mr kennedy Thank you, Sharif. I believe that the Transhumanist Party in its role as the opposition has presented a compelling case for why we should not fear advances in artificial intelligence, but why we should approach them with openness and discernment and a spirit of collaboration among humans and artificial intelligence. And it's interesting to me that the government through Minister Donald expressed its meaning of fear as the way one would fear a rattlesnake. And I'm quite familiar with the threat of rattlesnakes because I run on trails in Northern Nevada and rattlesnakes manifest themselves from time to time on those trails. But what is also important to understand is that there are tens of species of snakes who are absolutely harmless, like garter snakes, for instance. And those snakes appear on the trails a lot more commonly than the rattlesnakes. So how should one approach the threat of rattlesnakes? Certainly one should not be ignorant of rattlesnakes and what they look like. One should know how to recognize them visually, but most snakes one comes across are going to be harmless. So if one does not uh, undertake certain activities just because there might be a rattlesnake, one is missing out. One is losing certain opportunities for benefit that could be actually quite powerful. And with the prospect of AI solving a lot of our logistical problems, improving safety, remedying existential risks, increasing the wisdom to which we have access, certainly the opportunities here are much greater uh, than those uh, that could be derived from going on a trail run. Now, with regard to human biases and biases embedded in the data, as uh, Minister Marshall pointed out, yes, that is a risk today, but it is possible that AI, through the application of systematic uh, processing capabilities that humans are not capable of, might actually spot hidden biases in the data uh, that humans might not be aware of. And again, through a collaborative process between humans and AI with each uh, set of entities checking one another and refining upon one another's conclusions, we could arrive at a situation with fewer biases. And indeed, as uh, our fellow opposition member Tom Ross pointed out, humans have a lot of emotional uh, baggage, uh, a lot of evolved emotional tendencies that may have served us well in certain contexts, but no longer uh, might serve us well today. So if AI is capable of arriving at recommendations that don't manifest those biases, we will at least have some different perspectives some different options that we could choose to avail ourselves of or not when solving certain problems. And I think the analogy to snakes is actually appropriate here too, because precisely of what the government mentioned in that uh, identification of AI is not perfect today. There is a lot of hype in corporate circles, for instance, and a lot of companies, when they say they're using AI, they're actually using old fashioned deterministic scorecard types of algorithms. And that's what we primarily see when it comes to deciding whether somebody is eligible for a mortgage or whether somebody is assessed as being likely to commit fraud or criminal activity. And I agree, those deterministic scorecards can be problematic. They uh, essentially are just a codified system of if-then statements, and they apply a kind of one-size-fits-all, often stereotypical view. But that's not true AI. True AI is dynamic. It is able to analyze and understand content and context. It is able to respond to new information. It is able to self-correct and also receive corrective input from human beings. It would be in the case of the smart algorithms of the future, like another human uh, that you would be talking to and feeding them new information and they would not uncritically accept it, but be able to react to it and analyze it. So I think we have a lot of potential with the future of AI. And the concern with fearing it is that we might actually leave the field to stagnate in its present, not yet fully developed incarnation. And in that situation, we might actually be stuck with some of the limitations of the algorithms of today. So uh, I would like to conclude the opposition's case by stating that we should have hope for progress in this field. And if there's anything we should fear, it would be stagnation or hyper regimentation that would stifle that progress. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Now I request uh, like Prime Minister of the Parliaments, Mr. Roth. 
All right. Um, well, sadly, the opposition has failed to make their case. Um, we opened with the argument that AIs have three inherent problems. Uh, one is they're poorly understood. Two is they can make decisions uh, very rapidly. And um, <laughs> it always hurts when you forget what your third point is. But anyway, so the so the so going through the going through each of the arguments, Mr. Kennedy argued that autonomous car limitations. Uh, and admitted there were autonomous car limitations, and argued that the that the uh, that cars um, weren't killing people as long as the cars were driving themselves. Yet virtually every every accident, all twelve of them currently under investigation in the United States, were caused with either the, the uh, driver in the passenger seat or the driver otherwise involved. Um, that I would agree with Mr. Kennedy that the, there's a tremendous amount of hope for progress in the future, but I would argue that perhaps we should de delay deployment until that progress is made. Uh, he also argued that if that if we didn't uh, enter this field, that the field would stagnate. I would argue, in contrast, um, supporting from some, several of his other speakers, that AI is is moving. Uh, whether we adopt it or not, will have little uh, impact on the advancement of AI. What we want to do, want to uh, put forth is, at this particular point in time, the fear of AI is significant enough for us uh, to consider at least put in place a pause before uh, deployment. Uh, one of the things he pointed out that was particularly concerning was machine rights and citizenship. Uh, we're not even doing a good job with human rights and citizenship at the moment. Uh, we're not at all prepared to deal with machine rights and citizenship, something that, that, that should be very concerning. Uh, he argued fairly uh, strongly that governments were ill-suited to regulating AI, but that same argument could, be, could, be, could have been leveled against nuclear power, cigarettes, uh, petrochemical industries. Um, um, all these large companies that have done our country a tremendous amount of damage uh, due to the lack of regulation. And we've certainly seen the lack of regulation in, in uh, more mature countries than our own result in huge problems with regard to water pollution and um, air contamination. And we've got a, a global warming event uh, going on right now that shows that, that the industries cannot successfully regulate themselves. We just had a, a huge meeting amongst all the governments regarding addressing these these uh, significant problems with regard to our environment. Uh, David Smith argued that AI is in its infancy, which I would agree wholeheartedly with. That's the problem, it's in its infancy. Deploying something that can make decisions at machine speeds that is not even mature makes very little sense and could do a tremendous amount of damage. Uh, he argued that it would be going back, be like going back to smoke signals and using rocks for axes, but it wasn't too long ago that, that people were arguing that Perhaps we should be using and advancing a variety of, of, of technologies, of battery power, for instance, uh, before we realized those batteries could catch fire and we didn't yet have the technology to put them out safely, or certainly not the training. Um, the, he, he spoke to the inbred intelligence of, of humans, and several of the speakers talked about the fact that, that uh, AIs could do a much better job of handling bias than humans do, but that, that has not been the case in practice. Uh, facial recognition we know has, has failed catastrophically. One of the first applications of AI uh, were, were connecting people of color to monkeys, creating huge political problems for the organizations that deployed them. And currently, um, a number of countries, have, have, instead of deploying facial recognition, have begun to ban it uh, because it's caused so many social problems. Once again, pointing out not that it doesn't have the potential to do good, but the actual practice of the application of AI has done, has done bad. Uh, Tom Ross. Uh, talked about how AI, when it becomes smarter, it becomes kinder. Has that been our experience? Have more developed nations who are arguably smarter than less developed nations been kinder and gentler to those nations? Uh, perhaps the U.S. should ask the Native American Indians just how kinder and gentler the Europeans were that came in and helped them find their new future. Uh, fear has served, he point, our, uh, Ross also argued that fear has served our, our, our race well, protecting us from problems that could otherwise do us harm. And I would argue that is the case here. Our natural fear for something that could do us harm causes us to think about taking a pause, a pause we probably should have taken with nuclear energy before turning it into bombs and wiping out a large portion of Japan. We do not want that same outcome to happen with artificial intelligence. Um, he pointed out, uh, Tom Ross again pointed out, there was no way to govern this thing or enforce any guidelines. That's a serious problem for government because that is our role. We have to govern that thing and enforce guidelines. If we can't do that, then perhaps we should not touch the technology. Um, and finally, Tom Ross argued that it was too late to stop this. I would argue it is never too late to stop anything. It is the role of government to protect our citizens. And if we don't step forward and protect those citizens, we will have dead bodies of politicians out of office and huge social problems. We have to do our job. We cannot say any technology and any or any advancement is beyond our capability to control because it is our role to control those things to keep us safe 
and we need to step up and keep those those citizens safe and that is the basis for our fear of artificial intelligence it is not ready uh, we aren't ready for it and there is no evidence that we will get there anytime soon thank you thank you honorable uh, prime minister for your That's excellent summary <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. This, this is fun. Debate is very important. And especially like a party like Transhumanist Party, if they are active in politics. So we want to see them in real parliament soon. Maybe this kind of practice and mock parliament will help them. I want to give special thanks to all of our debaters with very short notice. Everybody join. And I'm sure, I'm sure uh, this is very, very high quality debate. Even I know that many of them actually not from really debating background, but how you analyzing today's debate and how you analyzing different things. This is really, really high quality debate. And especially the university students, school level students, they can learn a lot of things from uh, today's debate. Now we have a special analyst for today's debate. Professor Paul will give some comments and uh, give some things. And uh, uh, who is the winner and who is the loser? We will not declare. Actually, the audience, they will decide who is the winner and who is the loser. So, Professor Paul. Yes, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, it, if I was an AI, I might have a uh, better analysis, but I'm just a human and uh, lots of good arguments on both sides. Um, some big gaps in uh, coverage, um, things that weren't talked about. Um, but to start off, I mean, fear is a transient emotion. You can't always be in fear if you are, uh, your health uh, declines quickly. Um, so we have an internal mechanism within humans to um, keep fear being transient. And after a while, you know, if you're fearing something for a long period of time, whether it be AI or climate change or something that is always sort of there in the background, um, then eventually that fear is replaced by either uh, some sort of acceptance uh, that, that this is a controversial thing and it could lead to harm to, to um, you, many people, or it may not, but you kind of, you know, you have to replace that word fear. It's no longer fear. It's some sort of, you know, Zen uh, psychology or acceptance or whatever. So that's one thing. Um, the uh, time frames, um, I didn't hear very much on time frames, and I think time frames is a big issue. And also, I didn't hear very much on, uh, you know, we t humans, uh, we tend to uh, fear, it, it's difficult for us to fear more than one thing at any given moment. So if I'm out for a walk and I see that snake, I could have this fear reaction. And I'm certainly not thinking of AI at that moment. I'm not, I can only hold one fear really in my mind at a time. And that, you know, being humans, that thing that we fear jumps from jumps uh, to from one thing to another thing to another thing. So um, <clears throat> we really need to consider human psychology a bit more when we when we use a term like fear, you know, in, in, in the debate topic. But, um, you know, it's also we don't have a good human understanding of what super intelligence would really look like or be. And, you know, we can talk about the singularity, which I understand it as being when AI is so smart that it can generate additional AIs, which we, we will then have very difficult, um, we, we have very little capacity as humans to understand what that might be uh, ahead of time until it actually happens. <clears throat> and I would say that, you know, um, it's hard to talk about, uh, we shouldn't talk about a single singularity, if you like, we should talk about multiple smaller singularities in different fields. And I'll give you a couple examples. So using AI uh, to develop, uh, to play games, specifically chess and Go, okay, what we found is that the AIs uh, playing chess act to human chess players, very strong grandmasters, you know, to the very sort of, uh, you know, uh, weekend or club chess players that have some un good understanding of the game, but are on a completely different level from grandmasters. Um, the comment from all of these players to the uh, chess playing AI is that the chess playing AI is like an alien. Okay. You know, it's playing on a different level. It, it plays some moves which completely defy all human logic and analysis um, at the time it is played. In fact, you know, humans would consider it a big mistake, but then you have to go much, much deeper beyond human ability to calculate in chess just to realize that that's a good move, that that was a brilliant move or the, um, the, the idea that that was a brilliant move and not a complete blunder um, only comes out in the result of the game. You know, it worked or it didn't work. Um, the same thing in Go. Um, 
the AI and Go uh, made found moves and found positions and found strategies that the, the strongest Go players in the world had no idea existed in the game. So again, it was like an alien. Its intelligence was far beyond uh, you know, our comprehension. So I would argue that in many, many different fields as AI develops, um, then it, um, you know, we're going to see these moments where we have no ability to fathom you know, what the super intelligence really is. And getting back to the time frame, let's suppose that it takes X years to develop an AI that is smart as the dumbest human. Now, we could argue who the dumbest human is, and we'll never get agreement on that, but let's say that takes X years to develop. Then I would certainly argue, and probably most of you would agree, that in order to, for the AI to advance to be as smart as the smartest human, call it a Stephen Hawking-like AI or an Einstein AI, would probably only take uh, a year or so, you know, six months to a year. It would take a negligible amount of time to make that advancement. So then the question is, is when you have these super intelligent AIs or Einstein-like, how long would it take to, for the AIs to start building AIs using their great intelligence? And this is where you get into the idea of, of a singularity where, where the AI knows everything and uh, you know, has, has incredible wisdom. And then you know, such a case, humans would not have the ability to understand what the AI was doing and why it was doing that. So human societies right now, people cling to power, you know, governments cling to power, fossil fuel companies cling to power, and they continue to subsidize, get subsidies from the governments um, to, uh, you know, continue to trash our planet, right? So do you really think that any of these governments would be willing to give up their power to an AI? I doubt it very much. I think this is the block to AI. I think as soon as AIs get strong enough to threaten human intelligence, many powers that be in society will shut it down. So I guess that the X is very important because we're threatened by lots of other things, right? The risks to society are enormous from abrupt climate change, for example, creating extreme weather weirding, weather wilding, weather whiplashing in what I call the climate casino to, for example, take out simultaneously take out uh, global food supply and cause famine and cause strife and geopolitical unrest. So we're also facing the loss of democracy in many countries around the world. Um, I have great fear myself of U.S. democracy failing in the next, uh, you know, next uh, election cycles, the midterms and then the, you know, unless unless the craziness in the election system is dealt with uh, before that time frame, and that is not happening. So all of these things, uh, there's a lot of near-term threats, not to mention COVID. You know, many people have fear over this new variant, which is exhibiting super exponential growth. I mean, in entire countries, it's doubling. The, the rate of infections are doubling every two or three days. And obviously, with those rates of infection, it's impossible for countries to keep up with even the recording of the data. So it's probably still accelerating at those rates, but not being reported. So we have all of these different threats that are coming up, and they always tend to surprise us because we're not thinking far enough ahead. And these threats, uh, threats uh, can very, very likely uh, reduce, uh, reduce uh, organization in society, cause governments to collapse, cause uh, immediate crises, which really will threaten the ability of humanity to uh, continue to advance technologically at rates that we're advancing at. It would become more of a game for more and more limited resources on the planet and uh, geopolitical conflicts. And so that the questions will be survival. They won't be how do we advance our society further. So, so I, I, those are just some things to think about. And the time frame is very important because if X is if, if that X number is five or 10 years, fine, we'll have to deal with it and fear AI perhaps, or use another word. But if that X number is 40, 50 years out, then you know, if there's an organized society that far out, then we'll need to worry about these things. But that's not, not a given, especially with abrupt climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Paul, for your excellent analysis. And I want to give special thanks to all of our de uh, debaters, uh, Professor David Smith, Professor Donalds, Mr. Tom Rose, 
Professor Rock, Mr. Marshall, Honorable uh, Chairman of the Transhumanist Party, uh, Mr. Kennedy, and Professor uh, Paul for your continuous support for World Talent Economy Forum. Welcome everyone. Today we have our another debate. We already get a huge response from the audience, from electronic media, even from the politicians. They really like our debate. So I want to welcome all of you for the another debate show in this mock parliament. This topic is this house believe that humans should invest in technologies, explore and colonize other planets. Uh, we have our six speakers, three from governments. For today's parliament, we have our honorable prime ministers, Mr. Kennedy. We have our Honorable Minister of Space Affairs, Mr. Andreas. We have our Member of the Parliament from the Government, Professor Paul. On the other hand, we have our oppositions. From the opposition side, we have our very strong opposition. Uh, even, even you know that the last uh, the last Parliament, they were in government, and that this Parliament, they go to the opposition side. Uh, I believe that this Parliament will be very strong and competitive because opposition, they want to gain again the government side and hopefully this will be a very competitive debate so from the opposition we have our opposition leaders uh, professor rob deputy leaders from the opposition side professor donalds and very strong parliament members uh, he is a very experienced politician uh, he has experience from around the world and most important thing is that in several times i lost debate against mr marshall in real life so mr marshall is the member of the parliament from the opposition side so honorable prime minister of the parliament what you want to propose and what you want to like share with our audience in this parliament thank you sharif and welcome to all my name is Janadi Stoliarov II, and now it seems that the Transhumanist Party is in the government. The tables have turned since the debate one week ago, and as now the government party, we are proposing that the government fully embrace space travel and space colonization of other planets. This is aligned with the U.S. Transhumanist Party platform on the subject, which states that the United States Transhumanist Party holds that present and future societies should take all reasonable measures to embrace and fund space travel, not only for the spirit of adventure and to gain knowledge by exploring the universe, but as an ultimate safeguard to its citizens and transhumanity should planet Earth become uninhabitable or be destroyed. So let's explore the various portions of that stance. First of all, it's essential to consider the motivation for human progress that enhanced space travel and space colonization will provide. The problem is right now, contemporary societies are mired in a crisis of meaning that arose in the postmodern era. Unfortunately, as a result of the various crises of the 20th century, and as a result of many philosophers abandoning a hopeful vision for the future of humanity, there are few objectives that inspire people anymore. And that wasn't always the case. We have had eras in human history where entire populations were essentially glued to the television screen during the space age in the 1960s, when the United States launched humans into orbit, when the United States landed the first man on the moon. And likewise, in the Soviet Union with the launch of Sputnik in 1957, with the launch of Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space in 1961. These kinds of achievements inspire people to pursue a better future, not just for humanity, but for themselves. They see what is possible. They see that improvement is possible. And that motivates them to lead their lives in more constructive ways. And that motivates them to pursue other innovations, including innovations that make life better here on Earth. Technology can be a source of great inspiration as it had been during the uh, development of railroads in the 19th century, during the development of electricity when Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla were popular heroes, during the development of automotive transport when Henry Ford was a popular hero, during the development of powered flight when the Wright brothers and Charles Lindbergh were popular heroes. And we need more heroes in our society in order to inspire people to live better and more hopeful lives. But but it goes beyond this. Our species right now is at risk because we are confined to this one planet and we are dependent on what happens to this planet. We are sitting ducks for phenomena that are currently outside of our control, like major asteroid impacts or supervolcano eruptions or large climate shifts. And I agree that there are many approaches that are feasible to combat these kinds of phenomena, but space travel is an essential piece of this. If a large asteroid heads toward Earth, how are we going to deflect it? How are we going to 
neutralize the threat that it poses to the survival of our species. Right now, our means for doing that are woefully limited. But if we have a robust space infrastructure, if we have several orbital settlements, if we have stations on other planets, we could deploy measures much more readily to address that asteroid impact. And moreover, we diversify as a species. Even if some catastrophic event happens on Earth, that would not be the end of humanity. And indeed, the intact aspects of our species, the outposts that aren't affected by that event, could then assist any humans on Earth who are trying to recover. Now, there are also various resource issues that could be solved through space colonization, both through asteroid mining and through colonizing other planets. We could get many more precious metals, which are in limited supply here on Earth but we could export them from the asteroids and the other planets to Earth. And furthermore, we could address various issues like climate change. For instance, if there are factories that emit carbon dioxide or other undesirable substances into the Earth's atmosphere right now, perhaps in the future, a lot more of those factories could be based in outer space or on other planets. And that way we don't have to emit these substances into the Earth's atmosphere nearly as much. Eventually, we could solve essentially all of the Earth's energy needs through devices like the Dyson Sphere. Essentially, we could harness the entire energy of the sun for useful purposes. Right now, the vast majority of the sun's energy that reaches the Earth is just dissipated. There have been so many technologies that benefited life here on Earth that arose as a result of space colonization. And the following technologies are acknowledged by NASA as having been developed in large part due to the current efforts over the past several decades in space travel, space exploration, various research that has been done in space. These include ventricular assist devices for heart transplant patients, cochlear implants, LASIK eye surgery, artificial limbs, the use of light emitting diodes and medical therapies, aircraft anti-icing systems, and even 3D printing of foods, which began as a NASA funded project. So a lot of technologies that help patients live longer lives, overcome injuries and disabilities, and also a lot of technologies that can help solve some of the resource issues that are facing humans today, including perhaps the prospect of sustainable food production at home for everybody going forward. These are offshoots of space travel and space exploration efforts. And surely if we accelerate those efforts, we are going to get more of these technological innovations diffusing to the human population here on Earth. So not only is space travel and space colonization good in itself as a motivator for progress and as a way of expanding the reach of the human species, but the benefits to all of the humans who remain on Earth are going to be immense. Therefore, the US Transhumanist Party proposes that we embrace space travel and space colonization fully and devote a maximum available quantity of resources to that endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister of the Parliament. Uh, this is very good news from World Economy Forums. Honorable Secretary General, he also joined as an observer and debate analyst. Uh, for today's debate. This is very uh, important. I mean, uh, he is a experienced politician. Uh, he run very important global organization. Thank you, Professor Talib, for joining today's session. After finishing the debate, uh, you will give some analysis and I'm sure our audience really enjoy uh, today's debate. And beside that, uh, we will decide winner or loser after the show, not inside the show. So now time for opposition. Opposition is a very strong. They try to uh, come to the power again. They are doing a lot of field work and social work. So we have our opposition leaders of the parliament, Professor Rob. So parliament's brought forward the proposition that we should invest in other technologies and explore space. It's interesting to note that they didn't cover the other technologies much at all. They focused almost entirely on, on the exploration of space, which is certainly an important thing for civilization to look to, towards. But I would argue, or we would argue, that it is not something this country should take take a, a position is. It's expensive. Uh, NASA, even with the uh, the uh, uh, capital investment of companies like SpaceX has a budget of $22.5 billion uh, currently. Uh, it's the U.S. able to spend that kind of money. We, we can't even spend that kind of money on, on uh, re-educating re our people. And really, if we look at our priorities right now in country, um, they are, as you would expect, keeping our people employed, providing medicine, providing health care, um, uh, providing clean water. 
and um, and helping helping people live a, a healthful, capable life. And we're not meeting that requirement at the moment. This idea of going to space to escape the planet certainly sounds interesting. But if we took the same amount of effort and we actually worked to heal the planet and make the planet more livable, it would probably provide greater short term returns. Um, if we are if we if we pollute the planet and destroy where we live before we can find another place to go, we're still pretty much uh, messed up. The 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 difficulty here is with regard to priorities. Yes, uh, NASA has put forth a number of technologies up through uh, 2016 um, and 3D printed food, but we don't have the capability of even uh, manufacturing those technologies in our country yet. We have um, a, a lack of educated engineers. Our diversity programs are just getting started and and um, and our minorities and particularly women are underutilized. Uh, our money would be better spent fixing the problems that we have that are prevalent, prevalent as opposed to trying to distract the populace with a space program we cannot afford. It would be different if we had a place we could go that was that was close and achievable um, because I certainly agree with the idea of preserving the race is, is extremely important. But we have yet to identify um, a habitable, pla habitable planet that is within reasonable range of the Earth, and that, and if we can't even locate a place that we could go, then funding the the effort to get there seems to be money poorly spent. Uh, much better to look at the priorities that we have to keep government to keep government in place and operating. It, it, it if if the population revolts because they don't have food, uh, because we can't get them vaccines, because we can't get, keep them healthy. Um, we're not going to be able to make our space program work anyway. Um, much better to let the, the dance nations uh, spend their money on these programs. And, and perhaps we have our, our educational facilities participate in some remote way, but it, it is not a priority. Our priorities are, are very terrestrial in nature. And looking at technology in general, which is the part that the, um, that the uh, parliament uh, put forward, the prime minister put forward, um, that too is problematic. Uh, we lack the skills capable of installing the technology, servicing the technology, and making the best use of technology. We only have to look at countries li like Africa, Iran, and most recently Afghanistan to see what can happen if the support from the centralized uh, from the supplying government goes away. Uh, governments change. And so, the, so depending on a high technology company to come in and, and help us with government support uh, for long periods of time, may work over the short term, but for the long term, we'd be beholden to the, those governments. And, it, and this time around, it's not uh, the, uh, the UK, Spain, or France, or I should say England, Spain, or France. And we'll probably be looking at, at Russia and China. And we all know the problems of taking money from those, uh, from those countries that come with significant um, payback requirements that sub subordinate us to those countries. And I would argue that we, we want our government to support our citizens. We don't want our government to support some other government or some other location citizens. We want our government to support the problems we have here, not, not become subordinated to another country. Uh, that is not our purpose in being. Uh, we need to make sure that our people are healthy. We need to make sure our people are educated. We need to make sure that our water is clean. We need to make sure that, that, that our, our government is solid and sound and that, and that, the, and that they support our people, not, not everyone else. I mean, Look at, for instance, look at look at the pandemic as it exists today. We do not have manufacturing capability to build the vaccines in country. If something happens to one of the suppliers outside of country, we're just going to be hit by the vaccine. And look and look how this virus came in. This virus came in from from other countries. We didn't have the virus come up come up here. It came came in over over from overseas, and we lack the protections to keep our people safe. We need to fix that problem first, and then we can think about things like exploring uh, exploring space and. And even looking at exploring space, we haven't even explored our oceans yet. And there certainly we've, we've discovered in the oceans and, and in the um, and in the uh, uh, the forests, uh, medicines and capabilities that we we are also just learning about, and that have a, a much higher near-term potential given our our current socioeconomic level. So um, I object to that to the position the government has taken. It, it is it is certainly fine for a country that prints money. Uh, and has uh, excess budget to consider things like space, space exploration or just investing in technology in general. But our needs are more fundamental. We have people that are sick. We have people that are starving. We have people that are homeless. Um, we are having a hard time uh, uh, keeping our citizens safe, um, as we've discovered from the pandemic. And we need to fix that first. That has to be our priority, not, not sending people into, into space. So there are a few people in government that I would certainly like to send there. Um, that, that is not that is not our our um, our priority. We need to focus on our people. We need to focus on the here and now because that's where our current problems reside. 
Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Opposition Leader of the Parliament, for your speech. Uh, now I request uh, Andreas. He is uh, also a Minister of the Parliament, Minister of uh, Space Affairs. We are observing all of the uh, very young and energetic Parliament. Actually, they took over the government side. So hopefully this will be very interesting. And besides that, uh, the peoples uh, from those who are observing this parliament, they have different questions. So if you have time, uh, beside your uh, uh, debate, you can you can respond. Honorable Minister of Space Affairs. Thank you. Yeah, what the, the position said so far, it did make a lot of sense and there were some great concerns. But the thing is actually that if you if you look at, at, at NASA's return on investment on what they're, what they're actually spending, uh, their, their budget, then for every single dollar that they're actually spending um, on on uh, everything that, 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 that they do and develop, they actually get back uh, somewhere between seven and fourteen dollars into the the economy, and that's just based on all the technologies and licensing and all, all these different kinds of ways that, that, that NASA is actually spending their money. And and this is actually just in the U.S. So if you if you just look at, at the world globally, we'll have likely a much, much greater return on investment than just between seven to fourteen dollars if you just really look at all the technologies and all the progress that comes from that. And and the and the thing is also that that um, the the Prime Minister also also uh, alluded to was also that that in space so many so many exponential technologies they're actually first developed in space because they they, ha they have to go for something radical and something different to, to make it work there because it's just completely different different uh, way of Going, going about things and, and they just don't have the same capabilities that we actually have on, on earth and and that that actually means that a lot of a lot of really important technologies that we're using today have been developed in space such as um, things in, in, in medicine uh, such as uh, a cat scan and x-ray and and also um, different uh, technologies to to clear blockages in 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 one's veins during heart surgery so there are a ton of different technologies that that have been that have come from from uh, space and have been developed there, and uh, that also uh, was mentioned by the prime minister, like in terms of things such as uh, food production and three D printing and and all that. Like sure. so, so if you just look sure. at those technologies and, and the impact of that, then there is certainly a lot to take away and a lot to gain from it all. And and even even uh, things uh, which which we take for granted uh, today, such as such as cell phones and uh, um, GPS uh, signal and all that, it comes from space. So if we if we ha if we hadn't explored space and gone out there, then we we actually wouldn't be able to communicate in the way that we are used to uh, to doing today, and, and our world wouldn't be as global and and as, as collaborative as as it is in some some aspects today. Um, so there, there have definitely been a lot of benefits from, from, from doing all this. And and also, if you just think about the, the future potential of, the, of the developing new technologies and, and finding new discoveries that we can we can use here on, on our Earth. Also, in, in, in terms of global warming, for instance, there, there have been a lot of beneficial discoveries in terms of how, how scientists can figure out ways to, to reduce emissions. Um, from, from space and 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 also uh, pictures from, from space have actually been very beneficial to, to really analyze what what is going on in, in different parts of the world and 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 uh, also just based on future exploration it's hard to know what what we'll actually find and all the benefit that we we can we can gain from that in terms of other planets in terms of of different uh, compounds like like all kinds of the metals what we can find and and, and use on, on earth the thing is also that our our resources aren't infinite so if, we, if we're just using our own resources, resources that 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 are really really crucial for our future de development, then we can find a lot of different um, materials and, and and find additional materials of what we're currently really needing um, on Earth. So there there are a lot of different things that that people don't really consider when when they actually think about uh, the the big cost of 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 um, exploring space and 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 to to just go go to new. Um, Go for discoveries there, but the thing is that there there's so many benefits, and and it, it's it's hard to predict um, the future for it. But but the thing is, if we if we currently have already gained so much from it, and we, we haven't even colonized any planets so far, it's just it's just the interesting to think about how how much more progress we can gain from colonizing different planets in the future. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Minister of the Parliament, uh, for your excellent speech. Uh, and now I request Deputy Leader of the Parliament, Professor Donald.
Hi there. I want to back in a little bit to what Rob started with, but before I do, well, there's been several questions and the honorable previous speaker just uh, talked about, which is colonization of planets. When you think about the solar system that we live in, there's nine planets, maybe eight, depending on whether you consider Pluto a planet or not. Um, and uh, the the only one that has any possibility of us colonizing in any meaningful way is Mars. And um, Mars has Mar Mars does has an atmosphere that's incredibly less than Earth's. It's like five times less than if you if you went to the top of Mount Everest where people can bar barely breathe, only certain people can, and then went five times as high, you'd be the atmosphere of Mars. And um, there's this idea, science fiction idea of what's called terraforming it. And the idea is that you use uh, certain kinds of bacteria that can actually live in circumstances like that, that produce oxygen and, uh, and use the dry ice, which is carbon dioxide that lives on Mars. And from that carbon dioxide and the water that's there, you produce enough oxygen that eventually you create an atmosphere there. And that that atmosphere is, uh, is enough that uh, it starts trapping heat and the carbon dioxide, um, that you produce enough carbon dioxide. There's a question if there's enough carbon dioxide available to actually do that, so we don't really know. Um, many people think there isn't. And um, so that would be a dicey proposition there in the first place. And the second problem is, is that Mars doesn't really have a um, magnetic field. So the solar wind would blow the um, atmosphere away and it would be very difficult to keep it there. So that's really not, it's, it's very questionable whether that's actually possible at all or not. So really what you'd have to do is to create a colony there is to have uh, airproof domes and somehow get the oxygen into those domes. And, you know, in theory, you could do it using photosynthesis or some sort of means where you could continue to produce oxygen. But in order to do that, you'd have to get the materials there to, to build it. So it'd be ex extremely expensive, and it would also be something that would be very difficult to maintain because you'd have to keep getting the materials there. Um, the idea that we could produce um, uh, factories, we'd have factories there that would produce the CO2 instead of on Earth. Well, the CO2 is, on Earth is produced by fossil fuels. So we'd have to get the fossil fuels to Mars somehow so that we'd be able to burn them. And that, of course, would be incredibly expensive as well. So really, in, in reality, it isn't, it, it's, it's, the costs for it are exorbitant and it's hard, it's, there's no way we, in any conceivable way that we could get a return on our investment. And the nearest planet is four and a, that could conceivably have life on it um, is four and a half light years away. It's, they're called exoplanets. And what they are is they're planets that are, in close enough to the sun and far enough away from the sun that they're in what we call the Goldilocks zone, which is the uh, uh, close enough and far enough away that they aren't too hot or they aren't too cold. And the closest one that we know of is four and a half light years away. And at the speeds that we go, it would take generations to get there. So, so the idea of being able to colonize other planets is basically it's science fiction. It's a wonderful idea and it's an exciting idea, but the costs of it and the return on the investment are just not there. And as I said, I was going to back into Rob's uh, idea, which is that we're faced, the problems that we're faced with are, um, are real. We global warming. I don't know if you've seen the movie. Don't look up. I'd really look, I really can't recommend it too highly, but it's uh, basically a metaphor where the earth is about to get hit by a giant comet and destroyed and people just don't pay attention to it. And I won't tell you the end, but it, that's sort of the situation that we're in right now. And I'm very interested in sociology. And there was a sociologist named Lester Ward who had the idea that we couldn't control society. We didn't really know what changes we could make that would solve all of our problems, but we knew enough now to try things that could possibly work and find out if they worked. And if they didn't, we could try something else. And we know enough now that we actually have things that we could try. And it would be, um, since we can do it, it's kind of immoral that we don't. And we need to start putting our resources into the kinds of things that we can do to start making a difference. 
So the idea that people are glued to their television set watching rockets take off, is that a good thing? Why is it a good thing that people are sitting around glued to their television sets? That, that to me, is a danger. In, we need to have the people in the world not outside working together with each other, loving each other, and making a, trying to make a difference to make the world a better place, to learn, to grow, to make the changes that we need to make to make our world not get hit by a comet, not get destroyed. And we don't, we don't need to, tr to try and live on planets that we really can't live on. We need to make this planet a place that we can live and do it as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Leader uh, of the Parliament from the opposition side. Now I request a member of the Parliament from the government, Professor Paul. If you look at science fiction from a few decades ago, science fiction novels, they were full of wonderful new technologies that we haven't heard of. Some of them are coming into existence now, but they were, they were full of hope, it seems to me, for the future. And if you look at science fiction now, um, it's almost exclusively dystopian, you know, dying planet, you know, um, losing everything that humans have worked for, losing human consciousness even, you know. Um, and so, so why is the switch there? Well, part of the reason for the switch is the things like the pandemic um, and the problems that we face with inequality, with poverty, um, with, uh, of course, the uh, risks to human society continuance um, from abrupt climate system change, you know, which is getting more and more um, under, like people are having more and more understanding. Um, it's not just the crazy alarmist, so-called alarmist, it's, uh, you know, the public is getting very concerned, in fact, such that um, young women are often reluctant to have any children because they're not sure what world we're coming into. So what we're lacking um, is, is hope for the future. Humanity really needs a common goal to unite it, um, and it can have this common goal through, you know, collective sort of, uh, you know, work towards um, some project, some enormous project. And, you know, what project could be better than um, expanding humanity's presence in the universe to, you know, go out into space, to try to colonize other planets, to try to um, provide, uh, you know, as Elon Musk calls it, planetary diversity. <clears throat> you know, if you look at some of the, uh, you know, greatest uh, thinkers of our time, you know, if you look at um, some people like uh, Stephen Hawking and, and and some, you know, top environmentalist people, you know, they're really uh, thinking that humanity is on its way out, that we don't have a, um, you know, that we're all heading in the wrong direction. So, you know, we have always been in our history an exploration species, whether it be, you know, crossing seas to, un to explore unknown lands, to go to the polar regions of the earth, to go down to the deep depths of the sea, to go to the tops of mountains. And, We've always been an exploration species, and why should that stop, I guess? Um, you know, it seems to be built into the human brain, the human psyche. We have, you know, definite novelty filters where we need to um, feel like we're advancing. We need new things. And, you know, the goal, we need, we need some very so-called uh, sexy goals. I mean, we have goals to eliminate poverty on the earth, to provide food for everybody, but those those goals are somewhat, you know, they're important, but they're, they don't um, really stimulate the imagination, you know, the human imagination, uh, like space exploration does. And, you know, as many of the great speakers um, have said, um, the, uh, the technology spin-offs from, from space exploration were enormous in, in, with past exploration and will likely become you know, much, you know, even more unlimited with uh, future exploration. And, you know, we're not, uh, you know, as we have this debate, there's uh, people um, on the planet, obviously, that are, that are putting forward the companies and the action to actually achieve what we're talking about. So it's not really a hypothetical thing, um, specifically, the advancements um, of SpaceX in the last few years have been arguably, you know, exponential with the Starship um, launches and successful landings, uh, the ability you know, on a routine basis to send up rockets to 
uh, put satellites in orbit, et cetera, to uh, get global communication systems. Um, and one of the big problems facing us, you know, on the Earth with climate change is, sure, we need to, you know, zero fossil fuel emissions um, and getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies will go a long way towards that. But governments continue to cling to this fossil fuel economy with, with their subsidies. So we've gone um, far beyond the point where slashing fossil fuel emissions is, will be sufficient to stabilize the climate of the planet. We also need technologies to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And one very good point was made that with um, putting industry that creates emissions up into space will, um, you know, sort of will, will uh, allow the, you know, the earth to um, recover, not to complete, uh, not to, uh, you know, have an atmosphere and ocean, you know, that is completely um, saturated with uh, greenhouse gas, uh, greenhouse gases. So, but in order to have time to do these things, we have to address the huge warming of the planet. And some of the ideas are marine cloud brightening to brighten clouds over the oceans to reflect sunlight away, or to put MEER is a project, M-E-E-R, to, to distribute mirrors on the surface of the earth to reflect solar radiation. But it seems to me that the simplest way to reflect some of the sunlight to cool the planet would be to have a vast um, area, very, very thin mylar sheet, uh, highly reflective, coated, luminized or, or with a gold film. And this would be an extremely low volume and lightweight device, but it would have an enormous ability to reflect away a small fraction of a percent of the incoming sunlight to allow the Earth to cool, to give us time to deploy these technologies to remove carbon dioxide and methane from the atmosphere, for example. So all of these things are, are kind of connected. We have very deep existential questions on the planet, but I think, you know, hope is part of the human condition. Humans need to have hope or they need to have reasons to get up in the morning to look right. forward to our future. And, you know, exploration of space is a way to give that, provide that hope and give humanity a common goal to unite it and to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Paul, for your excellent debate. Uh, we have our ana uh, another debate analyst, Mr. David Schumacher. Thank you for joining today's session. Now I request a member of the parliament from opposition side, Mr. Marshall. Well, thank you, Sharif, and thank you for my fellow parliamentarians. As a member of the loyal opposition, I'd like to point out that the debate point is not whether we deploy technology in space, it's whether we spend the, the assets that we have now to go into outer space and populate other locations and other planets. As we know, Elon Musk has already made statements to the effect that he is his target is Mars, and my fellow parliamentarians uh, have pointed out, as Donald pointed out and Rob pointed out, Mars has issues with it, especially for now. Uh, will they be overcome? I'm sure they can be overcome. We've overcome a lot of things in life. But I find it quite ironic that the transhumanist party, the members of the, of, of the government, um, uh, want to go into outer space when their very own members back in the 90s uh, advocated um, that this, their, their focus on technology was okay as was presented in Julian Huxley's uh, essay on that name, which created the Transhumanist Party. But uh, Natasha Vita, who was one of your early members, uh, she said uh, that her party was too neurotically geared towards uh, environmentalism. And here you're focusing money on, on, uh, on space. And as we've all pointed out, including your own members, Paul, uh, uh, the Honorable Paul and, and, and Gennady and, and and everybody has been mentioning the fact that we are faced with a existential threat of climate change and a climate crisis. And this is real. This is not something that somebody made up. Of course, there are plenty of people who think we've made this up, but the science is in. It's there. And not only that, uh, I, I take uh, umbrage with what Paul, um, the Honorable uh, Member of Parliament, Paul, uh, mentioned about uh, that uh, going into space will help us address climate change. Well. Yes, it might, but we have real solutions here and now on Earth. And yes, there is a return on investment uh, by NASA that uh, um, the, the head of the government, uh, Gennady, showed and, and actually enumerated the return on investment in $14 for every dollar invested. But I think what we're proposing, the uh, honorable opposition, is that we need to invest in the here and now 
practically to re to recover the planet from its problems. Now, if you want to send up a spaceship uh, to deploy a satellite that will help us get information about the planet, that's one thing. But the but the premise of the argument and the debate today is about going to other planets. Well, that's not going to help us right now. And time is of the essence. The Thwaites Glacier is melting, whether you like it or not. It's built in, it's baked into the planetary problems. And you're not going to change it by going into outer space. What will change it is deploying technologies that we have here and now to uh, remediate GHG emissions, lowering the carbon footprint, lowering the temperature to 1.5 degrees centigrade. And we know it's possible. Is it possible in time to change what's already baked in? Probably not. But certainly spending assets and money in going to outer space and going to another planet, which will take certainly a decade, if not more, of, of energy and effort. And NASA is not going to do it. The people that are that are trying to do it are SpaceX. In other words, Amazon's the founder, uh, Virgin Atlantic founder, and, and Elon Musk are the ones that are making the headway right now. But their funds are meager compared to what needs to be deployed to change the planet's uh, uh, climate crisis now, in the here and now. So uh, as, as the member of the loyal opposition, I would propose that we take those funds and we allocate them as GFANS, which is an allocation of a group of, of financial entities and governments to, to, to solve the climate crisis now after COP26, to get to a net zero now, not in outer space. Putting factories in outer space, great, but that's not gonna change what we have here and now. You're not going to uh, uh, change uh, global warming uh, by do, going into outer space. You're gonna go, you're gonna change global warming by allocating assets uh, to technologies that exist here and now to lower GHG emissions, improve soil health, improve water quality, improve the quality of life for humans on this planet here and now, on this planet, not on some other planet. By the time you get to that other planet, it'll be too late. If you look at Times Square, where this New Year's tonight, they're going to be counting down the, the clock for New Year's. Everybody follows it around the world. But there's another clock that's counting down. It's at 14th Street, Union Square in New York City, and it's counting down the climate clock. We have less than seven years. We have less than five years, essentially, or less than, we have a little more than five years about left on the climate clock. And what is that counting down? It's counting down the point of no return where we cannot recover, but we can, we have the opportunity. Just reallocate the assets and the funds and the energy, instead of going to outer space, which is admirable, nobody has a problem with going to outer space in, in the sense of science fiction or in the sense of getting there when we get there, but if we're going to save our planet and our people and our time, we need to allocate those assets here. One thing I'd like to point out, the approach that we, the loyal opposition take is yes, people come first, planet comes next, profits come last. And you can have profits. There is ability to get profitability out of the climate crisis if we address the climate crisis in a transparent and honorable way. But we need to do it here and now not in some future uh, idea of going and uh, launching uh, colonies into outer space. What about the rest of the planet? Think of all the people watching here now. Are you going to be in outer space? Is your children or your grandchildren going to be on that colony and be safe? We don't have the time for that. So I would argue, along with my uh, uh, Prime Minister Rob and my and, and our and our Minister Donald, that the our, our party advocates the ability to act now, but not in outer space. Take the $130 trillion that GFANS has allocated for climate change in ANR for here on this planet, not in outer space, not on some other planet. Mars is not gonna work. If you think it's gonna work, then I think you're in a, in a, uh, in, in a science fiction world. And that's okay, but what about your descendants and their descendants? Are they gonna be around here? We don't have time. So I would say that it's time to take the bull by the horns, as we say, and allocate the assets and money towards real solutions that exist here and now. How do I know? I am part of companies that have those solutions. We have the ability to risk uh, the climate crisis, we have the ability to risk mitigate the health crisis that come about because of the climate crisis. We have the ability to uh, address all these issues here and now on this planet, 
And yes, it's great to fantasize about going into outer space, but that is a fantasy, not a reality. It's it's real. We see people like Elon Musk. His goal is to take phosphates out of Mars and bring them back to Earth. For for uh, he's even stated that publicly to uh, to to increase uh, fertil, uh, fertilizer. But is that what we need? Do we need the, that approach to to uh, to uh, improving our soil health? I don't think so. I think that is a very expensive proposition. There's a, a simpler proposition here and now to take and take waste, pyrolyze it into soil amendments that would allow us to make a circular economy as opposed to the current economy we have of an industrial economy where we take everything and throw it out the window and don't recover it. We need to do what Europe has done, create the mission to create a circular economy to, to go back to environmentalism even though your own parliamentarian back in the 90s poo-pooed that, thinking that you guys are neurotic. Well, I think the neurosis has gone to space. That's what's happened. So we need to take a proactive approach on this planet here and now to take everything that we are doing and make it make better jobs, more wealth, more food that is healthy food for people to consume and create good paying jobs for people around the world. It doesn't have to be just in the United States. It can be around the world. It can be in Malaysia. It can be in uh, Bangladesh. It can be in Pakistan. It can be in India. It can be in Southeast Asia every, or Asia. Everywhere we are on this planet, we are threatened with a climate crisis that is here and now and approaching us at lightning speed, faster than any rocket ship that you're going to send up into outer space or that Elon Musk is sending up to outer space. So I think the time is of the essence. I believe that, that uh, our our head of government, uh, uh, the loyal opposition, Rob, and my fellow minister have pointed out, Donald has pointed out, that the actions have to take place on Earth, not in outer space. Outer space is great. It does help us create new technologies. We acknowledge that. But the technologies that we're using now to create the ability to turn around the climate crisis were created here on Earth, not in outer space. Yes, I acknowledge, you know, uh, uh, medical advancements and, and transplants and things like that took, came out of NASA, and we need that. Nobody's saying we shouldn't allocate funds to NASA, but if you look at the three private enterprises that are going into outer space, and you got Elon Musk being uh, accused by the Chinese that he's causing traffic jams in outer space, and outer space is so huge, so why is that occurring? That's because people are not thinking with their gray cells. They're thinking emotionally, and they're trying to get to outer space because it's Again, as the, as the government has pointed out, it's science fiction, it gives hope to people. That's fine, but we have undersea water problems that is, needs to be explored. You wanna allocate assets for exploration. Look at our planet. I just saw on, on a LinkedIn post, a picture of the planet of the Pacific Ocean. You know how we always see North America or Europe or Africa or the Middle East as the picture of that part of the planet? This showed the Pacific Ocean, it's all water. We are three quarters water. We are water. We need to solve those problems. So there's acidification occurring in the, in the ocean. If you want to solve the problems on this planet, going to outer space, yeah, it may help, but it's too little too late. We need to take what we have now and apply it on this planet here and now. So I say, along with uh, my prime minister, Rob, and my minister, Donald, that as loyal opposition, we say, stop your neurosis like your own advocate in the beginning of the 90s said, but come back to environmentalism, come back from outer space, come back down to Earth. We are on planet Earth. Everybody watching here is not in outer space. They're on planet Earth and they're being affected by a pandemic that is created on planet Earth that could be solved by planet Earth. So we can create the ability to prevent zoonotic diseases like the pandemic. We can do other things that are all connected to the environment and solve this environmental crisis and get people back to a human a true humanism that is people first, planet next, and profits last. I rest my case.
Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Speaker from the opposition side. This is very close debate. I believe that from the government and opposition, they are doing excellent job. And there's a good news that we have our observer from UN, uh, uh, United Nations, Professor Talib, as well as we have our politicians, uh, Mr. David Schumacher. After the debate, we will get some feedback from them. But I'm sure this debate is very, very close. And uh, I, I think that uh, we can decide after the rebuttal round. So first, I request uh, from the opposition side, opposition leader of the parliament, so the government has proposed we go out to space and go to places like Mars. Um, let's just take one example of the problem I'm put, putting forward. Um, studies have showcased that while Mars may be cheaper to get to, uh, living there will be far more difficult than Venus. We should, in fact, be going to Venus if, if we're going to another planet to preserve the race, because on Venus you don't need spacesuits and you don't need a magnetic field because it's already got one and it's already got an atmosphere. Yeah, you'd need oxygen, but 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 living on the planet would be far easier. Uh, that it would be Mars long term. Yet we're going to Mars because it's cheaper. And the and the reason we're going to Mars because it's cheaper is maybe we can mine some minerals and bring them back to the US and manufacture them. And of course, we know manufacturing is accounting for 23% of the carbon dioxide we're pouring into the atmosphere. Uh, it was argued that we can take that manufacturing off planet. Uh, that would be great, except once again, that's only 23% of the carbon dioxide. The vast majority of our pollution is coming from things like agriculture, which we could also move off planet, but just think of, of the logistics costs of the of the food our people who are having a hard time affording the food of today would be completely unable to afford the food of tomorrow which would be which would be pointless um our argument is is we have a series of problems we have to address here domestically that, that are causing people to die now uh the going off into space may may solve a problem of of an asteroid impact where we could escape the earth except right now we don't even have a, a foolproof way and certainly not in this country of, of even identifying an asteroid that could hit the planet let alone being able to prepare and get people on board and get them off planet someplace else that is safe. So what the, what the parliament is proposing is yet another distraction from the problems that we have today to spend money on technology and capabilities that we can't use. We lack the skills, the skills to, to, uh, to uh, take advantage of. And uh, our people are, are dying of, of, of problems that we can fix. We can control pollution. We can clean the water. Uh, we can find ways to manufacture the medicines we need in country. But to do that, we need the funds. And if those funds are going to some space space program uh, in the hope that we, we will develop a co uh, uh, something comparable to SpaceX, I mean, even NASA hasn't been able to, to develop something comparable to SpaceX. Um, why don't we just let SpaceX be SpaceX and um, and solve the problems we have here today where, where, where we need the help, where we need the funding and where the people that put us in office expect us to spend our time. If when they're safe, and, and we have free funds. I'm all for going going into space and, 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 and playing around out there. But until then, I think we ought to focus on our people and keeping them safe, keeping them healthy, and keeping them productive. The opposition Thank you. Board. Thank you, Honorable, Honor, Honorable Leader of the Parliament uh, from the opposition side. Uh, now I request for the closing remarks, uh, Honorable Prime Minister of the Parliament, before I give him floor, I request like after the, uh, this parliament, maybe you can develop some committee, uh, like climate change committees or any kind of uh, development committee, and you can give some chance to our opposition member of the parliament. Maybe they can serve uh, for your co committee and they can create a better economy and better sustainable economy for your country. So now I request uh, Honorable Prime Minister of the Parliament, Mr. Kennedy. Yes, thank you, Mr. Sharif, and we would certainly be happy to maintain an ongoing dialogue with our loyal opposition. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, in the course of that dialogue, I will be able to convince the loyal opposition that it has established a false dichotomy between the benefits of going to outer space and the need to solve problems here on Earth, because the two are not mutually exclusive, and the decisive answer to the opposition's critique is, why not do both? Why not do everything? The opposition claims Claims that there are budgetary constraints. However, if we think about the situation differently, the constraints may well go away. For instance, in the United States, the Defense Department and related activities account for roughly half of all discretionary spending. And by contrast, only 0.5% of the US federal budget or $22.6 billion, as the opposition pointed out, was provided to NASA. So clearly there is ample room to expand the budget for space exploration and colonization. Indeed, it was approximately four, four and a half percent at the time of the moon landing in 1969, and using much more basic technology than what we have right now at our fingertips in the form of our mobile phones, humankind was able to land people on the moon, and yet we haven't been back 
on the moon for nearly 50 years. And the advanced technology that we have developed in the meantime will make the task a lot easier. Now, the Honorable Opposition Member, Mr. Marshall, pointed out a statement made in the 1990s by uh, transhumanist Natasha Vita Moore. For the record, I would like to state that she was making that remark about the neurotic focus on environmentalism with regard to the Green Party, because she instrumentally ran as a member of the Green Party for the city council in Los Angeles, and she became disillusioned with the Green Party and resigned that position precisely because she thought that the Green Party wasn't forward thinking enough in terms of considering creative solutions to environmental problems rather than just focusing in the most direct way possible on those problems. But the fact is, you cannot solve major problems like the environmental problems that face our species using the same technology, the same thinking, the same status quo attitudes that led those problems to come about. You need a different approach, and that different approach is to push outward the boundaries of human possibility to create a robust space infrastructure that could then be deployed to help us solve those environmental problems. Will the space infrastructure be the complete solution? No, there are complementary approaches that can be deployed here on Earth, as the opposition pointed out, but I don't think that takes away from the government's case in this situation at all. There were examples provided of exploring our oceans or developing manufacturing capabilities in developing countries that currently don't have those capabilities. We can do that too. There have been statements made about healing the planet. Well, why not do that simultaneously? education, employment, medicine, healthcare, clean water, humans can be inspired to provide all of those if they see a positive trajectory for our species, which is what space exploration and colonizing other planets will provide. The opposition has stated we have yet to identify a habitable planet and the nearest exoplanet that might be habitable is 4.5 light years away. Well, why not create our own habitats, designs for orbital habitats like the Stanford Taurus or the O'Neill Cylinder have existed since the 1970s. It's just a matter of deploying the resources to actually bring them into being. The opposition has stated that in many countries, people lack the skills capable of installing, servicing, and making the best use of this technology. Well, uh, we respond that this does not preclude investments in technology education. Indeed, when technologies are available, when people see a growth industry, they will want to learn more about those technologies and become adept at them. Think about the many highly capable programmers that have arisen out of developing countries where there isn't a great internet infrastructure, there isn't a lot of access to digital technologies compared to more advanced countries, and yet these people learn the skills because they want to better their lives. And often they provide the IT workforce of more developed countries as well. So if the technological capabilities become available anywhere, I think people everywhere will want to be interested in them. And finally, because I understand our time is limited, the opposition pointed out to the Don't Look Up film as an example of the urgency of the situation that faces our species. Well, I would like to note that the Don't Look Up film literally deals with an asteroid impact that is about to affect the Earth. And indeed, we could be suffering from such an asteroid impact. We don't know when, but it would behoove us to improve our asteroid detection capabilities and invest ample resources because this is the kind of existential risk that could wipe out our human species. It's even more dire than climate change. So I would suggest it is a moral imperative for our species to overcome that existential risk. And all of the other benefits that stem from space exploration and colonizing other planets are added bonuses compared to preserving humanity. And with that, I hope that we in the Transhumanist Party, as the government have illustrated the vital importance of colonizing other worlds and greatly expanding our investment into space exploration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. Actually, we want to see you as a prime minister of any of the parliament, especially as a president in USA. And besides, all of the speakers actually doing very well. I think our audience really uh, excited that how and they, they bring a lot of questions and our speakers and the parliament member they actually respond many of the questions and uh, we are really happy that how they actually attend the debate how they take their preparations this is very close debate and we have our honorable debate analyst uh, he's a real successful politician uh, he was the ministers of uh, jordan as well as he was secretary general of UNWTO. Now he's also Secretary General of uh, uh, World Tourism Organization. This is part of uh, 
uh, World Economy Forum, uh, our great leaders, Professor Talib. Uh, Professor Dr. Talib, what do you want to add uh, for today's discussion? You are honored. Thank you so much. Speakers. Thank you so much, Sharif, for this yes. very interesting session. I want to say two things here. We should distinguish between the priorities, as the Prime Minister said, of doing outer space excavation or not, and the need to do that. In other words, I'm not against the opposition when they say there are more urgent problems that we need to look at here. But if we have the funds, and we will have the funds, we should do both, as the Prime Minister said, because we can't stop technology. Technology, to me, opens so many possibilities, so many avenues. And it is not right. I'm not a scientist to decide whether it's Venus or Mars, Professor Rob. I don't know. You decide on that. But what I know is that we can't stop the hope in technology. We can't stop the technology from moving forward. Yes, of course, there are problems on Earth now. Climate change, employment, poverty, inequality. All of these issues must be addressed. These are priorities, of course but especially the developing, developing countries, the develop, developing world. But that doesn't mean that we should stop our technological advancement. And space, to me, is another technological advancement. It creates hope and imagination in the minds of people, and we need that. We need that badly. We can't do without it, even if we decide not to. It's going to happen anyhow, because people are going to continue to establish new facts on the ground. It's the story of technology since mankind became mankind. We can't stop the flow of technology. And space is now the, the new technological venture. So that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prime Thank Minister. You. I completely agree Thank with you. You can do both. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, uh, Professor Dr. Talib. And uh, we want to see that uh, many of our parliament members, they can serve for different developing nations. And maybe you have a lot of opportunities or you have scope uh, to utilize our human resources for the global community. So I really impressed how you support World Talent Economy Forum. Thank you, Professor Dr. Talib. We have Thank our you. another highly experienced politician. Uh, he contributed a lot for the politics, uh, uh, Mr. David Schumacher, and he has different views. Uh, even though uh, I know he is from Transhumanist Party, but I feel that for his comments, he is not biased for the prime ministers. Uh, he will be uh, neutral and he will give his opinions uh, for this parliament. Yes, thank you, Sharif. Um, and you're correct. I think that's a, a good introduction and a good representation of my viewpoint. So as I've listened to both sides of this argument, I am actually very, very encouraged by the passion that I see from the different points of view. And I think that here is the real key as far as I'm concerned. Let's yes. harness the passion of those here on Earth, let's harness the passion of those who view going into space. And let's not just limit the discussion to that. Let's harness the passion that people have for making humankind, the planet, the solar system, wherever we go, better. Because when we do that, when we, when we harness that passion, it's like a ship moving and it has energy behind it. And we can make changes in navigation based on what we learn and we can direct resources based on what we learn, but the passion is actually the fuel. It's what keeps it driving forward. So as others have said, let's not do one, let's do both. Yes. How much of both do we do? How much fuel do we have? Keep fueling it with that passion. Let's learn and let's keep talking among both sides. And actually there's more than two sides to this argument. There's many nuances in all of this. Let's keep talking in that network and make each other's proposition better as one side contributes back to the other side. Let's do both. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. David Schumacher, for your excellent contribution for World Talent Economy Forums. Especially, this is very good learning for the developing world. Especially, developing nations has major problem in politics and policy development. So I believe those who join in today's dialogue and today's uh, parliament in the future, they will uh, contribute in, in their country in the parliament, inside the parliament. This is very important because I learned from Professor Talib, politics is very important. We should not avoid politics. We have to engage with politics and we have to solve problem 
through the political organizations. This is the one of the excellent examples that how we can create more effective debate inside the parliament. So thank you, honorable parliament members. Hopefully our audience, they will learn uh, different uh, important aspects from today's debate because debate is very popular in developing world. And this is the way how we can attract human beings and how we can solve many complex problems. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, honorable speakers of today's parliament for joining today's session. Thank you. Bye-bye and take care. Live long and prosper. Bye-bye.